Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're gonna talk about the five biggest money mistakes that I made as a teenager. Let's get into it. Mistake number one was being late to the investment game. So I only really started investing in 2015 when I was 21 years old, but I'd actually been making money through various side hustles and like a tutoring job and stuff since the age of 14. And I could have easily started investing when I was that age. Now we've all probably heard of something called compounding, which is the idea that the earlier you start investing, the more your money is gonna grow over time. And this means if you start earlier, then your money is gonna grow like like this rather than like this. This is compounding returns rather than linear returns. Now, this is actually not the main reason why I wish I'd started investing earlier. When I was younger, I really wasn't making that much money. I was making like $5 an hour doing some tutoring stuff. The mistake wasn't that I didn't put 20% of my paycheck into stuff and it would have compounded over time because really like when you're talking about small numbers like that, the compounding effect isn't that important. But the reason that I wish I'd started investing earlier was that it would have built that particular habit in terms of investing. And when I started making real money around about the age of 19, when my first business that succeeded started to do, started to do well, it took me about two or three years to get comfortable with the idea of investing. Cause I was always like, oh, I don't wanna lose my money. I, oh, I don't know what accounts to make. Like what the hell is an ISA? Like what even stockbroker do I use? And if I'd figured all that stuff out at the age of 14 to 16, I would have been able to hit the ground running with putting decent amounts of money into my investments from the age of 19 onwards but it took me an extra three years to sit around and wait for that to happen. Thankfully, I did start investing in 2015 at the age of 21, and the money that I invested then has grown quite a lot since then, and I've got a video talking about how much money I earned in 2021 that has more details about that. But yeah, that's one piece of advice that I would give to teenagers and also people in their 20s, and basically anyone who has not yet started investing, is that even if you don't have that much money, it is still worth putting $10 into an investment account, because then at least you have the accounts, you've verified it, you've given them your passport and stuff to do all the jazz, and you now know how to do it, so that when when you do start making real money, you can then actually hit the ground running with investments. Mistake number two was spending money on really low value things. For example, when I was about 13 years old, I decided to buy a Dell Axim, which was a personal digital assistant, which was like, like, you know, this PDA type thing. And that was basically like one of these organizers that like business people used to keep track of their Outlook emails and calendar and stuff. I had no need for this, but I thought I was like, oh, you know, I'm a tech kind of guy. I want to get a personal digital assistant. And it was just a total waste of money. And people at the time were like, why don't you just get a PSP? And I was like, no, I want to be cool because I want to be like a business person organizery type guy. Now I'm all for spending money on things if they're actually going to be worthwhile. And so I've got a couple of rules that I now think about when it comes to spending money that I wish I could tell my teenage self. Rule number one is the law of diminishing returns. This law says that the more you have of a particular thing, the less happiness you're going to get from that particular thing. So on this note, anytime I make a tech review, I always get questions from people being like, oh, should I get the budget iPad or the iPad Air or the iPad Pro or, you know, questions like that. And my answer to that is always that it kind of depends on what you have right now and what you think you need. Because like there is a big jump from going to no iPad to having an iPad, even if it's the budget iPad. But then you get into massive diminishing returns if you want to upgrade even more money to the iPad Air or even more insane amounts of money to the iPad Pro, God forbid the iPad Pro 12.9 inch. And so whenever it comes to evaluating tech, I'm always in the back of my mind thinking about diminishing returns and thinking, do I really need to spend like an extra X hundred or X thousand pounds to upgrade this particular thing? because it's probably gonna be some diminishing returns on that. Rule number two is asking, is there anything else that I would rather spend my money on? I've got two life-changing pieces of tech that I think everyone should try and save up for at some point. One is a Kindle, because Kindle is amazing because it helps you read more books. And the second one is actually AirPods or one of those AirPod-like devices that makes it that makes it much easier to listen to audiobooks. And again, I think if I were making the decision about should I upgrade this piece of tech into that thing or spend money on this, I'd, I'd be thinking about, okay, is there a life-changing piece of tech I could buy with this money instead? Or is there some kind of experience that I could buy instead, which I'm far more likely to remember? And rule number three is I'd be asking myself, do I really want this thing or do I think I want it because society wants me to want it? And one interesting way of framing this is that if I were the only person on earth, within reason, would I still want to buy this thing? Now, when it comes to something like an Apple Watch, the answer is probably not. It's broadly a flex item that I buy because it signals something to myself and to other people. But if it's, for example, a laptop, I would buy it even if I were the only person left on earth because I'd be able to use it to create stuff or whatever. This example starts to break down because if, if I was the only person on earth, then maybe that actually won't work out. But hopefully you get the idea. The idea is that we do buy things for signaling status to other people. That is generally, in my book, not a very effective use of money unless you have too much of it. And so I, that, that is something that I like to keep in mind that I wish my teenage self would have kept more in mind. Do I really want this thing or am I just convinced I want it because society wants me to want it? And finally, rule number four is do I really want this thing or do I just like the idea of this thing? And this applies very nicely to my purchase of this ridiculous like Dell Axim personal digital assistant where 
the thing I wanted wasn't actually that. What I wanted was the feeling of feeling of feeling important, feeling like I'm a business person who has like stuff to do and businesses to run, even though none of that was was at all true at the time. And maybe still isn't like to this day, I don't know. But I was definitely in love with the idea of having a PDA rather than the PDA itself. And I think I've made a similar mistake on a bunch of other things I've bought over time. You know, certain types of clothing, I made some very like dubious clothing choices when I was in my teens and probably early to mid twenties as well. And often it was because I liked the idea of having that piece of clothing rather than the piece of clothing itself. So that's just another thing I wish I would have known when I was a teenager. All right, mistake number three was actually getting stuck in the cheapskate mindset for too long. And we just talked about the mistake of spending too much money on things that actually don't make us happy. The cheapskate thing is the opposite end of the spectrum where we spend too little money on the things that would potentially make us happier or would add large amounts of value to our life. Now, firstly, there's nothing wrong with having a mindset of frugality, especially when you're young and you tend not to have that much money. Like that small amount of money needs to go a long way. And so it's totally fine to be very, very intentional about the things we spend money on. But at least for me, even when I was making money, I found that I, it was hard to get out of that mindset of having to having to be frugal about all the things. And I just didn't really appreciate the money value of my time. So for example, even when I was a teenager, I probably could have made like $5 an hour by offering my services as a web designer. And yet I would spend like dozens of hours trying to find the cheapest web hosting on the planet or like a way to hustle a free .com domain name. Even though like that thing, that search took me like 10 hours and if I just paid for it, it would have cost like $7. So I think I was kind of pretty out of proportion with um, spending large amounts of time on things rather than actually choosing to spend a little bit of money. And I don't think this is a problem just for teenagers. I think even when you're an adult and you start having a real job that makes you real money, it still can be sometimes hard to get out of this frugal mindset. For example, I run a course called the Part-Time YouTuber Academy where places on this course cost between $1,500 and $5,000. And there are hundreds of people that sign up every few months when I run one of these courses. But it's always surprising to me because like often I'll recommend an app of some description when people are like, oh, well, you know, what app do you use for this? And I, I, I'll tell them what app it is. And the next question they ask is, oh, is the app free? As if they're, they don't want to spend $3 on an app, despite the fact that they've paid $1,500 to $5,000 to attend this course. You know, this, this, this balance between using money well and saving money gets too much in the realm of saving money. Speaking of saving money, I also strongly think that saving too much money as a teenager is a bit overrated. And the reason I'm saying that is because when you're a teenager, your earning power is gonna be the lowest that it's ever gonna be in your life. Like when you're in your 20s and you have a real job, you're gonna earn way more money than you could have ever earned as a teenager, unless you're one of those like crypto millionaires. And because of the law of diminishing returns that we talked about earlier, if you spend, let's say 20 pounds or $20, the amount of happiness you would get from spending that $20 as as a teenager is way higher than it's gonna be in any other time of your life, generally speaking, of spending that same $20. And so when it's a choice between, do I really wanna save this $20 and put it in my savings account, or do I wanna have a nice experience with my family or with my friends, I would generally err towards the, when you're a teenager, spend the money, just have that experience. There's not really that much value in saving that $20, caveat, unless you need that $20 for your family or something better like that. Obviously that doesn't apply to you, but in general, for the most part, I think teenagers shouldn't be too concerned about saving too much money. And that's one of the problems with like all this financial advice stuff where people are like, oh, save as much money as you can. It's like, well, actually $20 goes a long way when you're a kid. And when you're not a kid, $20 isn't actually that much, again, depending on your life circumstances. And so if we break this down into two rules, I think as a teenager, you should spend rather than save. If option one, you've got future returns to that thing that you're spending money on. So spending money on like education is actually very useful because there are probably future returns to that. Or option number two, if you have something to fall back on. Again, obviously, if you're a teenager who needs physically needs that money to survive. You don't want to spend it doing frivolous things. But if you're a teenager and you're watching this video, you probably do have some kind of safety net to fall back on like your parents. And so if you have that strong safety net, there isn't really that much point in saving large amounts of money when you're a kid. Again, because your earning power is going to be so much higher when you're in your 20s and 30s. So we've talked about money mistakes that I made when I was a teenager. But one thing that I think I did really well was investing early on in skill development. Like back in the day when I was learning to code, I would buy these like web design books and learn how to code from those. And coding graphic design, web design, web development. These are all skills that have really helped me over time. And these days, if you wanna level up your own skills, you in fact do not have to buy a kind of big ass book that teaches you HTML, but you can in fact learn things on an incredible platform called Skillshare, who are very kindly sponsoring this video. Now Skillshare is great for lots of reasons, but my personal favorite reason is that I personally have like 10 different online classes available over at Skillshare, which if you're one of the first thousand people to hit the link in the video description, you can get free access for a one month free trial and you can watch all of my online classes on Skillshare. Most popular one that I've got there is about 
about productivity. It's about like my principles, strategies, and tools for being more productive. I've got a very popular one that's very popular with students, which is how to study for exams in an evidence-based way. And I've just released a brand new one, which is YouTube for beginners. So if you've been thinking of starting a YouTube channel or you haven't quite taken yours seriously, I walk you through step-by-step step exactly the process I've taken to start a brand new YouTube channel with all the stuff along the way. And it's really long, it's very, very detailed, and it literally has all the information about getting started on YouTube in my head in this class, ready for you to watch completely free of charge if you're one of the first thousand people to hit the link in the video description. Beyond my stuff on Skillshare, which I love plugging to death, uh, there's also thousands of classes on all sorts of other topics. My friend Thomas Frank has a really fantastic one about productivity. MKBHD, Marcus Brownlee, has an amazing Skillshare original that breaks down his production process, which I learned a lot from as well. And so for basically anything that you want to learn, Skillshare is the way to go. Number one, start with my classes, because I teach you lots of things on Skillshare, completely free. And number two, you can like search and find these other amazing classes as well. If that sounds up your street, then do hit the link in the video description and the first thousand people to click on that link will get a one month free trial to Skillshare. Isn't that fantastic? So thank you very much Skillshare for sponsoring this video and let's get back to me from the past. Mistake number four that I made as a teenager was to buy things from unreliable sources. So when I was 18, I decided to buy a MacBook Air. It was my first Apple product. I was gonna become an Apple fanboy, get into the Apple ecosystem. And because I was trying to find a good deal, I ended up getting scammed out of like thousand dollars of my life savings uh, from this dude on Gumtree, which is like the UK equivalent of Craigslist. And genuinely, when I was that age, I thought I was like invincible from getting scammed. And I'd see all these like fake download buttons on websites and be like, haha, I'm not falling for that scam because I'm intelligent and I know stuff and, 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 and all of this. But actually, there's a bunch of studies that show that teenagers and really old people are the two groups that are at, at like at the highest risk of getting scammed from stuff. And I've actually had a bunch of messages from teenagers over the last few years since I've started this YouTube channel from people being like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm such an idiot. I fell for this crypto scam or I fell for this gambling scam and now I have no money and, and you know, that, that, that kind of stuff, which is really sad to see. But hey, I've been there, <laughs> lost all my life savings because I tried to get a good deal on a laptop from Craigslist. Now, there's a bunch of things I could have done to kind of mitigate the risk of that experience. Number one, I could have used something like PayPal where there is actually buyer's protection. And it was a bit of a red flag when the guy was like, oh, I don't really like payment in PayPal. I'd prefer to, to take payment in cash. And when you give payment to someone in cash, like there's literally nothing you can do about it if they go run away with it. And secondly, I think I had a real fear of discomfort. Like had I been a bit more like taking my time with that whole transaction, I could have inspected the laptop I could have been like, huh, this all feels a bit weird. Let me just take my time inspecting this before I like rather than handing over the cash. Whereas at the moment, you know, the guy seemed to be in a bit of a rush. I was like, oh, I, I don't want to cause him too much of an inconvenience. You know, I was apologizing to him for making him come all the way to London to, you know, sell me this, scam me out of this laptop. Like I had this real sense of wanting to please and I think I've realized that when you're buying stuff, there's no need to have a sense of wanting to please. It's still probably a problem that I have, uh, but like that experience when I was 18 really like struck home the idea that if I'd just taken a bit more time and run the risk of the guy being like a bit annoyed, you know, he was already in London. Like I could have, again, just sort of not had that fear of discomfort stop me from examining the product properly. And I guess rule number three that I'd say to myself is that I shouldn't buy things that I don't understand. Like I actually didn't research enough about the MacBook Air that I was trying to buy before buying it. Because if I had done, if I'd done even an extra 20 minutes of research, I would have realized that the product he was selling me was not actually the 2012 model of the MacBook Air. It was in fact the 2008 model of the MacBook Air. And that would have been abundantly obvious if I'd just done a little bit more research. So the thing I tell myself is that especially when you're handing out large amounts of money, don't invest or buy some something that you don't understand. Similarly, I wouldn't advise people to buy crypto randomly if they don't understand the underlying philosophy and the kind of mechanics behind how crypto works and have a really a clear thesis for, okay, here is my conviction and this is my conviction as to how high crypto is gonna be in the next few years. And finally, mistake number five that I made as a teenager around, around money was misjudging the dollar value of my time. Now, when I was younger, I used to do a bunch of freelance web design and web development stuff. And my first few, few projects were for like $5, $10 here and there. And it was pretty amazing having that feeling of making money on the internet for the first time and thinking, yes, I'm gonna be rich. This is magical inter internet money. This is fantastic. But one of the mistakes I made is that like, you know, when I was around 14, I signed up for these two big web design projects where they were paying me like $300 to design this front end and back end and this enormous like custom coding thing that was needed for this big website project. And what ended up happening was these web design projects took around three years to complete and I got paid $300 for like three years worth of work times two. And at the time when I first got the project and I was 14, I was like, oh my God, $300. I've never seen that much money in my life. And I signed up to do this like ridiculous sort of thing that was gonna take hundreds of hours. And then over the course of three years, my 
I, I, you know, the, the hourly rate I ended up with was like way lower than I would have got if I just flipped burgers at a McDonald's instead. And so there's really two lessons from this that I would want to tell my teenage self. The first one is something that I picked up from Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, which is again a book that I wish I had read way earlier in 2007 when it first came out. Tim says we need to distinguish between relative income and absolute income. He writes that absolute income is measured using one holy and inalterable variable, the raw and almighty dollar. Relative income uses two variables, the dollar and time, usually hours. So suppose Jane makes $100,000 per year. She works 80 hours per week and 50 weeks per year. This means Jane makes $25 per hour. John makes $50,000 per year. He works 10 hours per week and like Jane, 50 weeks per year. So John makes $100 per hour. So even though Jane earns twice as much overall, John is four times richer when we factor in the time that he spends working. In my case, obviously, when I took on these web design projects, I was just thinking about the absolute income. I was like, oh my God, dollar signs in my eyes, like life is amazing. And I had not at all factored into a kind of like factored the fact that this was gonna take hundreds of hours of work to make these websites. And the second lesson that I tell myself is something that I picked up from a chap called Naval Ravikant, who talks about setting an aspirational hourly rate, which apparently he set at $5,000 an hour, even when he was young and not really making very much money. That's that's way too much money. And his, his theory is is that you should just not do things that are making you anything less than $5,000 an hour. That's probably a little bit excessive. I don't think I would have gained much from following that advice when I was younger. But what I like to do these days and what I kind of wish I'd done sooner is this idea of setting a realistic hourly rate. Like if I did an extra hour of work, how much would my time be worth if I put in an extra shift at the, st at the tutoring center where I was working? Or if I did a little bit more web design -y type stuff? And then just generally being aware of that dollar value of time, especially if I was doing something where I wasn't also getting extra benefits like learning or like having fun. I'm not saying that when I'm a teenager, you know, everything, every single thing in my life needed to have been valued on this like hourly rate. But certainly for stuff that I didn't already enjoy doing, I should have been a little bit more like, hmm, maybe I don't want to do this thing because the amount it's going to make me per hour is less than what I want that number to be. So those are five of the biggest money mistakes that I personally made as a teenager. And I hope that you won't make those mistakes, but maybe you will and maybe you learn from them. Anyway, if you want to hear more life lessons, then check out this video, which is 21 lessons for my teenage self. That'll be linked right over here. Thank you so much for watching. Do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.